Good afternoon. Thank you for those who've joined us here at the Department of Commerce and to those who are joining us online. I am Arun Kumar, Assistant Secretary for Global Markets and Director General of the US and Foreign Commercial Service. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this instance of ITA Trade Talks. Before I start, I want to acknowledge and have a few thank yous. I want to thank Tu Trang, Tu Trang Fan, who's sitting right up here, for all the work in putting this together in this excellent location. I want to thank Rich Fisher, Marcus Johnson, and Donald Bell for photographing and for, for videotaping and broadcasting this. So thank you for all your help. Without all that, this will not come together. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, my friend and former colleague, Michael Burke, Chairman and CEO of AECOM. It's a very special honor for me to introduce Mike. He and I were fellow partners at KPMG LLP some, some time ago. And I followed uh, Mike's career with great admiration. He has grown AECOM from two billion in revenues to over 20 billion in a span of 10 years. And that is an extraordinary accomplishment, and I applaud that. Thank you. Thank you. And AECOM operates in an area that is of great interest to us in the Department of Commerce. So as you look at US exports, we export about 2.35 trillion a year. How do you move the needle? To move the needle, you have to look at the areas where there's huge potential. And today, there are few areas with greater potential than the whole infrastructure space. And in that space, AECOM is a leader in very many countries. AECOM is over 100,000 people, Mike. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge force to contend with. And I think we're going to learn a lot listening to Mike today. So the way we're going to structure this is, is we'll talk with Mike about his career, about the global infrastructure opportunities, and his views on what we and, and U.S. companies can do. Uh, before we start, I think you're going to um, run a, a short video. Run a short video. Yeah, I think I'll make a few comments okay, if it's great. okay, yeah. and then we'll, we'll turn to the video. But first of all, Arun, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. As Arun mentioned, uh, we were partners together at an earlier point in our career, and it's uh, just a delight to see us uh, across it again here and uh, have an opportunity to work together with the Commerce Department as you're trying to advance the interests of U.S. Uh, companies abroad, and we're, of course, trying to grow our business abroad. So I think we have a common interest here, and I, I'm just delighted that uh, you've given us this opportunity to talk to your team today. Uh, about what we might be able to do together. Uh, but what I thought I would do is to, to give you a sense for our company, what we do, where we do it, and how we do it. And then, of course, uh, uh, I think Arun has some questions for me, and we'll be, of course, happy to take any questions uh, from, from the crowd here. Uh, but as Arun mentioned, uh, AECOM is a global organization. We have uh, approximately 100,000 employees, another 30,000 employees that we control through joint ventures around the world. Uh, we operate in 155 countries. Uh, we operate in all seven continents, and yes, all seven continents, including Antarctica. We did all the engineering work for the Haley uh, Research Station in Antarctica, and the team that works on that, it's the longest commute in the world. If you think your commute is bad, uh, commuting to Antarctica is a bit of a challenge. It takes about 10 days to get there. Um, <laughs> so uh, just remember that on, on your uh, commute uh, home this evening. Uh, but all of these people coming together uh, are coming together for one mission, and that mission is to make the world a better place through infrastructure. Uh, there, there are not too many places in the world that I travel to uh, where either the citizens or the government says, uh, we have too much clean air, we have too much clean water, we have too many great roads, uh, we have too much electricity. Uh, the, the work that we do in the infrastructure space around the world is something that is incredible demand. Now, sometimes there's not enough uh, federal funds or, or, or uh, government funds to pay for everything that people want, but clearly uh, the need for our services, providing infrastructure services around the world, is in great demand. And one thing that we realize is that uh, the governments around the world have a few responsibilities. And one of those primary responsibilities to, to their citizens is to provide safety, security, and good infrastructure. Right? Everybody thinks about what, what's the role of government in, in these 155 countries in which we operate. Uh, first and foremost, it's safety, security, and infrastructure. So we're there to help these governments be successful. 
um, and along with it, uh, help uh, U.S. business become successful. So uh, yesterday, uh, Arun and I uh, met with Secretary Pritzker uh, and talked about the mission of the Commerce Department to, to, uh, uh, to, to promote U.S. trade. And in addition to promoting the interests of U.S. business, it's nice to be able to do that when you're bringing something of importance to the countries in which we operate in and, and, and many of you are responsible uh, for. If we can bring commerce and in addition bring good infrastructure, uh, we meet the common uh, uh, needs of both U.S. business and, and that country. So let me talk a little bit about infrastructure and what, what we mean by infrastructure. It means a, a, a number of different things to different people, but uh, first and foremost, when people think about infrastructure, they think about clean water, they think about transportation, they think about air quality, they think about having a resilient infrastructure that protects the citizens from natural disasters. And so let's start with water. Um, every single day, there's 750 million people in the world that have limited access to clean water. 750 million people have challenges uh, and, uh, with their access to clean water, something that we generally take for granted here in the United States. Uh, incre increasingly not taking for granted in the state of California where we're in the midst of a 10-year drought. Uh, but every year, every day around the world, 2,000 people die from unclean water. 2,000 people every single day die from unclean water. It's the second largest cause of death in the world, unclean water. So the, the fact that we are the largest engineering firm in the world uh, in the water arena, we have a lot to bring to bear to uh, the countries that, that you represent around the world. Next is transportation. Uh, we all know that uh, the benefit of transportation infrastructure is that it reduces the friction in the economy. The friction that's caused by the inability to freely move people to productive jobs and to freely move goods, goods to their intended use. So that friction in the economy due to poor infrastructure is overwhelming in just about every major urban market of the world. Um, I just recently returned from India and uh, the, the, India is probably the most significant example of this problem. Um, India has 1.1 billion people. It has 25% of all the starving children in the world. Yet, at the same time, 15% of the food source of the country of India spoils every day. And you say, how can this be? We have starving children and we have food that's spoiling every day. It's because they don't have the infrastructure that allows them to easily transport food from the rural environment to the urban environment. And so on my recent trip there, I was never so proud of the work that we do as a U.S. company in that country uh, as I am on the work that we're doing on the Delhi to Mumbai Industrial Rail Corridor, helping design and build a rail line that will allow better, better uh, transportation of food and other goods throughout the country. So that's the transportation segment. Uh, next is energy. Uh, we're a significant player in both the design and the construction of power assets, uh, both, both fossil fuel uh, generated as well as alternative energy uh, and new energy type uh, assets. Uh, but every single day out of the seven plus billion people in the world, 1.1 billion people don't have access to predictable electricity. And uh, we, all, we all, again, take electricity for granted, but it's the biggest predictor of the movement of people from the underclass to the middle class, access to electricity. Uh, so 1.1 billion people without electricity around the world, uh, that is what we are bringing to the global market. And, and, and as we focus on what can we do as a U.S. business to, to generate activity and commerce for the U.S. and at the same time bring something of value to the country's uh, electricity is one of them. Uh, next is resilience. And, and what I mean by that is we have seen a dramatic increase in the incidence of natural disasters around the world. Uh, in the past 15 years, we've seen two and a half trillion dollars of damage caused by natural disasters. And it's because cities haven't planned well enough for natural disasters and created a resiliency around it. Uh, now, we do a lot of work in the cleanup from natural disasters like Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and we do that work, but we're more interested in providing the, the preventative type work, like we're doing for the storm systems in Saudi Arabia, like we're doing for, for storm uh, protection in the country of China. 
It's uh, the major urban markets of the world uh, need this service to protect them from natural disasters. So that gives you a sense of why it's important for us to work together to bring infrastructure to the countries that you represent, why it's important for U.S. interests to bring that, and we have a, co a, a common need for this service in all of the countries, regardless of the countries that you might be represent or you might be focused on. Uh, but with that, I'd like to turn it over to the video to give you a sense, a, a little better sense for what we do. project means a lot to me and a lot to everybody down here. Uh, as a New Yorker and uh, being part of the uh, rebuilding of Ground Zero is an honor. Every day, on every continent, our architects, engineers, designers, planners, scientists, builders, technicians, and project managers are creating a better tomorrow. For me, AECOM is all about people who passionately and enthusiastically work together, taking dreams and turning them into reality. How? By sharing their expertise and knowledge and uniting together for a common purpose. Good urban design provides the city with an opportunity to create something that its inhabitants can feel proud of. We call it Mindshare. And this is how you transform a single life, a community, a city, a nation. It's exciting to see how some of our new understanding, as well as our new approaches, is shaping a, a drastically different world. This is a By rising to the challenge together, we soar higher. Will that make the world a better place? We think so. In countless ways. Nearly 100,000 strong. What the project shows is the strength of the community and New York City as a whole. What we are as people, you know, the workforce down here takes a lot of pride in what's going on, especially with what happened at Ground Zero. So hopefully uh, that gives you some of the sense for the projects that we're involved with around the world. Every single one of those pictures in some way related to one of the projects that we're working on. But I'd like to now take it uh, down a little one step further to help you better understand what we do. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our vision is to become the premier fully integrated infrastructure firm in the world. And what I mean by fully integrated is the ability to design, build, finance, and operate these infrastructure assets that are so important to the communities in, in which we live and the communities we operate uh, in, in 150 countries. But let me start off with design and what that means to us. So our design business is where we do the architectural, engineering, program management, consulting, and, and urban planning type work. And I'll give you a few examples in each of these categories what we do. So in the design engineering type work, we're the largest engineering firm in the world. Uh, here in New York, uh, we are in the midst, and we're now 15 years into designing the first new subway in Manhattan in 50 years. It's the Second Avenue subway down the entire length of Manhattan. And we are doing the design engineering work on subways around the world, everywhere from London to Saudi Arabia to New York and India. So it's a big part of our, our, our business. 
We are also very involved in urban planning, and urban planning is about allowing cities to understand the nexus of all of these different infrastructure elements and cause them to operate very efficiently. A couple of our projects you saw on the, uh, the, the video here was the, was the London Olympics. A great example, we were the master planner for the London Olympics, where not only did we build the master plan for the entire Olympic site, but we also reinvigorated the east side of London and left a legacy after the Olympics by providing low-income housing and an entirely new reinvigorated part of the city. We're now doing that. You saw a, a photo here earlier of the Rio Olympics uh, 2016. Uh, we will not just produce a master plan and facilities for the Olympics, but we will leave a real legacy behind, and now we're beginning the, the, to uh, plan for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. So major urban planning, not just around sports events, but entirely new cities like the smart city of Dolera in India. So it's a wide-ranging urban planning. That's the design side of our business. Then we move to the build component of design, build, finance, and operate, and that's more of the construction type activity. Uh, we're one of the largest construction companies in the world, constructing everything from super tall buildings to schools to power generation facilities and oil and gas assets. You saw in the video a great example of the World Trade Center. It's, uh, we just completed the building of the World Trade Center in New York. Uh, it is the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere and just something that we are very particularly proud of given that we have now made an indelible imprint on the new skyline of Manhattan uh, in, in, in the, the wake of 9-11. Uh, we had, we had a, 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 a missing component of the skyline for a while, and we're really proud of what we've done to uh, help that city revitalize. So construction services is increasingly important to us. The, other, uh, the next element is the finance side. Uh, we have a, a, an organization called AECOM Capital where we bring capital to our projects together with our client to help jumpstart projects a great example of that is right here in D.C. at the corner of K and 2nd Street. Uh, we are partnered with Toll Brothers to both build as well as finance a 500-unit residential project uh, mixed-use property uh, right here in, in, in the district. Moving to the next component is our, our, uh, the operation of asset or our management services group. Uh, it's one of the larger components of our organization where we manage large-scale facilities primarily for the U.S. government. So we manage all, all of the operations and maintenance requirements for large-scale facilities like the Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, like the headquarters for the, uh, the agency in Langley, where we are managing these facilities and everything that's associated with them. But we are also now uh, uh, doing much more of that work abroad, and it's something that Arun and Secretary Pritzker and I talked about yesterday afternoon, is how we can bring these services to uh, foreign governments. We are providing operations and management services for the UK government managing their, de their defense estates group. We're doing nuclear uh, uh, management for the UK government. We are now helping design and manage the new Indian seabird port, seabird port for the Indian uh, Navy, and we're doing that in other countries. So as we think about how the Commerce Department can, can uh, work together with us, as we are seeing an increase in defense cooperation agreements around the world, uh, we can also provide the infrastructure <laughs> necessary to implement those uh, defense uh, cooperation agreements. So that gives you a little sense of where we do things, what we do, uh, but it's equally important to us how we do it. And what I mean by that is the safety and integrity by which we de deliver our services. Uh, as, as we compete in a global marketplace, uh, I can tell you that we are significantly differentiated on this front. There are many of our, our non-U.S. competitors uh, that don't play by the same ethical rules that we play by. They don't have the same foreign corrupt practices regulations that we have. And they don't place the same value on human life, unfortunately. Uh, but for us here at AECOM, safety is critically important. It, it's important in everything we do, and we, it's, we have a promise to our 100,000 employees and their families that we're going to return them home safely every day. Uh, so that is a different way of operating in the global construction market than some of our global competitors, as well as the ethical foundation. Um, and it's not just what we say, but others recognize it. Uh, this year, we were recognized by Fortune magazine as one of the world's most admired companies and something that we're particularly proud of. So it's not just what we do to make the world a better place, 
but it's how we do it. Um, and as we start to see uh, this relationship with the Commerce Department, uh, I know all of you have an interest in not only uh, creating commerce for companies here in the U.S., but for the companies in which, or the countries in which you operate to make those countries a better place. And I think we have commonality of interest on that. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about what we do and where we do it and how we might be able to work together. And Arun, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to talk to your group today. And uh, I think, Arun, you have a few yeah, questions thank you, uh, Mike. for me. So I'll yeah. stop there. Thank uh, you. That's a great, great introduction. Uh, and in fact, I had a number of questions, but you hit on many of those questions in your comments. It was great. Um, but let's step back and look at the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. So we, in the infrastructure space, why do you think this is a good time? And two, what do companies need to think about to be successful in the infrastructure space globally? So the first part of the question is, why is now a good time? And you know, there's, it's always been a need for infrastructure, but the need is growing dramatically. And it's, it's, it's growing dramatically due to the urbanization trends. It's, and you see it in, in all the big cities here in the U.S. where people are moving from a rural environment to the urban environment. Urban density is increasing. And so as we see between now and, and, and 2050, uh, it's, the world population is expected to grow by 2 billion. Most of that growth will happen in an urban environment. And if you look at China alone, uh, China is expecting over, over the next 25 years for 300, people, 300 million people to move from the rural environment. Sorry, the microphone just came off. To move from the, the rural environment to the urban environments of the eastern seaboard. And so as those people move into the urban environment, that's happening all over the world, uh, you see an increased demand for infrastructure. Those cities are becoming in incredibly congested, they're becoming polluted, and they don't have access to, to water and, and, and energy. So the urbanization of the world is happening at a rapid pace and therefore driving an increased demand for an already challenged infrastructure. You know, I was last week uh, in one of these new cities, Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. It's quite incredible to see this amazing city coming up in the middle of the vast steppe. And there was very little there just about 15 years ago. Mm. So that was kind of a visible example of the kinds of things that you do around the world. That's right. So for US companies to be successful, well, what should they do? What's helped you be successful? What can they learn from you? So I think one of the important uh, pieces is that, that uh, we strive to be local to the environments we're operating in. Uh, what we have found, and we've watched some, some of our competitors try to deal with these challenges by flying in the paratroopers and do a project and leave. And, and we have found that that is not the most successful way to operate. Uh, first of all, we like to create a sustainable environment. So when you go to our, our office in Beijing, uh, yes, there will be some Americans there, uh, but it's primarily Chinese. And so uh, we do that in Saudi Arabia. We have a, a, a significant uh, non-Saudi population, but we want to create a sustainable environment where we have a partnership with the local population. We also look to uh, form joint ventures with the local uh, partners because the size and scale of these projects that we're taking on oftentimes are much better done by aggregating the resources and expertise of multiple parties, sometimes multiple U.S. Uh, uh, parties, not just foreign parties. And so if I look at uh, Saudi Arabia, I just returned from a trip there, uh, visiting one of our significant projects, the Riyadh Metro System. It's a $28 billion project, and our partner there is another U.S. company called Bechtel. And so uh, we look to partner with other U.S. companies to go into those markets, so we're going in with the United Front. So actually, tell us more about how U.S. companies can partner with you and other primes. Mm -hmm. uh, because our interest would be uh, how many of our equipment and service vendors can play into the kinds of projects that you plan and yeah. play out. So uh, the range of services needed on these projects, it really is extraordinary. And so on just about every project that we do, 
there's an aggregate of, of primes and subcontractors, and we are always looking to maximize the U.S. content to that. And so we do have a number of U.S. partners that come with us abroad, and um, I think to the extent uh, there are new partners that you work with that would like to go abroad and don't have the platform, because we, we talk to a lot of smaller uh, businesses here in the U.S., they want to go abroad, but they realize if you want to go into Saudi Arabia, the cost of setting up a business there and the cost of learning the environment, it's, it, it, it's overwhelming for many middle-sized businesses. And we all know the U.S. economy is driven by the, the middle-sized businesses, not, not by businesses of our size. And so uh, we are always looking to take those middle-sized middle businesses to us, to, to our projects overseas, to, to benefit from our footprint. We have offices in all of these countries. We understand the law, we understand the cultures. Uh, and so to the extent the Commerce Department has uh, companies you'd like to help us uh, uh, get together with, we'd be happy to, uh, to, to listen to all of them. That's great because we are, as you know, very focused on small and medium enterprises, yeah. which as you mentioned are the big engine of our economy. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a person on our team who leads our infrastructure team who will be coming to talk to you, a couple of people will be talking to you later about how to link uh, SMEs into what you do. Yeah, I think that's critically important because, uh, you know, if you look over the last, uh, you probably all know the statistics better than I do, but if you look over the past 20 years, the job growth has not been created by people in the Fortune 500. Uh, it's been created by the, the, the small and medium-sized businesses. And so uh, that's to the great benefit of both this country and for us to see economic growth around us. So now in the global infrastructure space, while there's a lot of need for infrastructure, as you pointed out, there's water, power, mm -hmm. construction. There's also this issue of financing. Mm -hmm. And so we hear about public-private partnerships, concession models, and then you mentioned your own approach of having AECOM capital. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the way through all this? How can American companies access capital uh, and mm -hmm. succeed? Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we've been a player in that space for a while. Uh, we own 30% of a company called Meridium that has about three billion of assets under management. More than, more than two billion of that has been deployed already in the infrastructure space, almost entirely outside the US. And so uh, we've been a player in that for a while, bringing capital to, to, to those projects. There are, are various stages of development of the P3 model and the concessionaire model around the world. Uh, the U.S., surprisingly, is very behind the times in, in public-private partnerships and concessionaire models. I hope that we will make progress here in our own country, uh, but we have union resistance and we have political resistance uh, in, in various states. But it's starting to gain momentum. But if you look to Europe, Europe has done it very well. Um, I, I was talking with some folks on my recent trip to India. India has been challenged with it, and it's been challenged because they're trying to get the, the, the risk-sharing model right. And so th th I'm a firm believer that bringing private capital to infrastructure is an enormous part of the solution. It's not the only solution. I don't think government's the only solution. It's government will provide a certain amount of infrastructure, uh, but the private sector needs to bring more of its capital to, to play. And I think it could do it uh, more efficiently, uh, but we're trying to work through that risk uh, model in certain countries. And I'm, I'm very, very uh, pleased with the progress that we've seen over the past 10 years, uh, but, it, but uh, there's a long way to go. When you come to talk about governments, government procurement practices seem to often come in the way, the L1 or the lowest cost approach. Mm -hmm. Do you see any movement there? How do you work through those issues? Yeah, it's, um, you know, even, even our, their U.S. government uh, procurement, uh, they went from uh, best value uh, for the most part to a lowest cost technically acceptable uh, or lowest price technically acceptable. And so, uh, m most uh, countries around the world are looking for value, and uh, we recognize that, and uh, price matters, and so we have got to compete on price, um, but value matters also, and it's become a difficult market. The margins are slim. That just means we've got to work harder, we've got to work smarter, um, but uh, for the most part, the cost of infrastructure implementation has been coming down. Um, and it was too high for a long period of time. And so I think we're seeing a move towards much more price sensitive buyers and the buyers for infrastructure are predominantly governments. And so we're seeing a global uh, movement where every market we go into for large projects, everybody's at the table. 
it's the, it's the Turkish contractors, it's the Saudi contractors, the Chinese, the, the Koreans, uh, you've got China State Construction, you've got Samsung, and then there's a handful of US contractors. And so the competition is, is much more global than it ever was. Um, I was recently uh, in Beijing meeting with the uh, head of China State Construction, and I was shocked to hear him tell me that now 40% of their profits, of China State Construction, it's the largest contractor in the world, 40% of their profits are from projects outside of China. When you think of all the building that's going on in China for the past 20 years, and you think now that 40% of it is outside of China, they're coming into our markets, and they know how to get things done in a very price-effective way. So if we want to compete on a global stage as a U.S. Uh, uh, design and, and construction firm, uh, we're going to have to figure out how to do it cost-effectively. I'd like to uh, get some questions from the audience, and I've got a few more questions later. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for coming to Commerce and, and talk to us uh, about this uh, infrastructure business. It's, it's a huge opportunity. Um, I'd like to hear more about the financing uh, bits of it, because as I understand, everybody else is more advanced than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that the Commerce Department or the government can do uh, in that space, if you have a wish list of what it is that uh, you would like to see us and our colleagues in government um, uh, to do to, to help you succeed outside. And lastly, what percentage of your business is um, outside of North America? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the last piece, our business outside of North America is, is 40 plus percent of our business is, is outside of North America. But you know, what can the Commerce Department do? You know, we have. Um, uh, some legislation uh, in the pipe here for the export, the ex import export bank, right? It's it's something that has been controversial here in Washington, and uh, the XM Bank has done a great job of helping U.S. companies bring financing to infrastructure projects uh, around the world. And so, to the extent uh, you can encourage uh, our legislators to uh, uh, help the XM Bank uh, uh, get refunded, uh, I think that makes a big difference because. Uh, funding those projects. Uh, we are not the only one funding those projects. Uh, yesterday I heard Fred Hockenberg, who's the head of the XM Bank, uh, say that uh, they were aggressively going after funding a major rail line in Africa and they could only get 6% of the project. They wanted to fund more of it, but they could only get 6% because every one of the export banks from around the world were jumping into it. So um, if we don't uh, provide easy financing through the XM Bank, um, Somebody else is going to step up, and, and uh, as, as, as Fred called it, you have plan A is go to private financing, plan B is go to XM Bank, and plan C, C stands for China. China is funding infrastructure projects around the world. So uh, that's, that's one of the most helpful things I think we could have out of Washington is encouraging your legislators to step back up with the refunding of, of XM Bank. But uh, to take that a step further, for, for those of you that are out in the global marketplace, uh, there are a number of countries that want to bring private sector financing into play. Uh, some of them don't have the right transparency, a, a nice word for too much corruption, uh, to, to, for U.S. companies to get involved. And so to the extent we can continue to, to advocate in these foreign markets for greater transparency, it gives us an even playing field. What we, is all we want is an even playing field in these countries. And in some countries, we just don't have an even playing field because there's too much corruption. Uh, so those are some important things, I think, uh, that, that, that the Commerce Department could do to help us uh, advance the ball on, on uh, private sector money and financing. So do you find that if you work with projects with multilateral bank financing, the transparency situation is acceptable? No question. Multilateral financing, whether it be World Bank, uh, uh, XM Bank or uh, Japanese Bank, the African Development Bank, uh, all are the type of projects that we are very much interested in because the transparency is typically very high, uh, for one. Uh, secondly, they're usually high quality projects because they've already been vet vetted by the multilateral banks and those are projects that we're very interested in and World Bank is a big client of ours uh, and we participate in quite a number of their projects. Yeah, so one of our initiatives is to promote those kinds of projects, mm -hmm. projects that are vetted and they need to be financed by the multilateral banks, promote them to U.S. industry. Yes, we're very interested in those. Another question? The one, another question comes up. You know, it's often said that in the infrastructure space, 
you need to have very early knowledge of the project. I mean, when we were in the service business, we knew that the RFP was too late to be responding mm -hmm. to, a, to a client requirement. So how, how do you, do you, first of all, is that true? And two, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? Yeah, you know, it, it is true because uh, certain RFPs that come out are, uh, are bidding for hard bid lump sum projects. And, and that's usually not the kind of projects we want to get involved. We want to get involved where they're, they're, they're looking for our expertise, they're looking for our intellectual capital, not just slip the bid under the door with the lowest price. And so we tend to, to not only have enough assets on the ground to be developing those projects, but learning about those projects well before they come to fruition, and oftentimes creating the demand. We, we participate in a lot of countries where they don't know what the solution is. They couldn't put the RFP out if they wanted to because they don't know how to frame the problem. They don't know how to frame the solution. So to put an RFP out, you need to have a little more clarity around the solution. So what we have found is in many of these countries, um, and even in, in, in jurisdictions here in the United States where municipalities that need our help, understanding the nature of the problem, understanding the, how there's a tight nexus between a transportation problem and a water problem and a housing problem, and they're all linked together. It's like, it's like a, a grab it onto a big water balloon. You grab on to the transportation piece and out pops another problem around housing. And so it's bringing that entire solution or creating the solution and therefore the demand for that integrated offering uh, that helps us get ahead of it. And so you know, for, for, co for companies that want to go abroad, it's much about creating the, the solution or creating an awareness that the problem exists and how to solve it uh, before you get to an RFP. And so that's what we're focused mm. on. So, you know, one of the areas that we've been focused on quite a bit in, in many continents is this whole smart city concept, which is in some sense saying, here's a solution, here's an approach which talks about energy efficiency and sanitation and so forth. Is that, uh, is that an approach that we should promote? Yeah. Uh, there's no question that cities have grown through a patchwork of problems and, and micro solutions. And so you look at any, I shouldn't say, I was about to say any city, but overgeneralization always catches me. Uh, there are some cities in China that have been built from scratch that hold a million people and they were built from scratch. They were planned perfectly. They had unlimited land, resources, money, and they are perfectly planned cities. And, and we have been involved in a number of these very large cities in China. But that's not reality. Um, we're seeing it in Dolera in India right now, but for the most part, you're looking at big metropolitan areas, whether it be Sao Paulo, Mexico City, cities that are a tangled web of infrastructure that doesn't relate to one another right now. And so the entire smart city approach is easy for us when it's a place like Dolera where you have unlimited land and you're starting from scratch or, or projects uh, like you see in, in, in China. Uh, but for the major metropolitan markets of the world, that's where we see a big part of the coming challenge in the next 20 years as this urbanization increases dramatically. As you see increasing density, um, it's difficult to step back with an entire start from scratch uh, approach because you already have transit lines in place, you have housing stock, you have water sources. Uh, so the smart city approach is causing people to step back and, and, and say, let's not plan individually for transportation. Let's think about transportation and, and housing together. Let's think about transit-oriented development. So we, de we develop a community, both housing and business, around transportation nodes, and that is going to be the way to deal with urban planning going forward. I have a multi-parter, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit in parts, but I just wanted to ask sort of generally where do you see the biggest areas for growth over the next five to 10 years? And specifically, where do you see opportunities for growth involving those US SME collaborations that you mentioned earlier? Mm -hmm. And I guess also what tools does your company need to get to those steps? So uh, the, some of the biggest opportunities for growth, first of all, uh, n never count out the, the, the U.S. right here. I mean, the, the U.S. Uh, is always going to be a big, stable source of growth for our business and, and every other business. But I'm assuming your question was more outside the U.S. 
Yeah, so if, if, you, if you look at the, 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 the global footprint, uh, China is slowing. Uh, we all know China is slowing. Uh, but Southeast Asia is probably in that region uh, going to pick up the slack where, uh, where China left off. Uh, India is, uh, you can't count out in India. The, 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 you have a, a, a highly educated uh, country with enormous size um, and maybe has a little too much democracy, if I can say that, um, <laughs> that gets in the way of getting things done. Um, and uh, I, I, I think uh, I, I've seen real encouraging signs with the Modi administration that wants to break through some of that democratic bureaucracy and allow them to get things done. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very bullish on Southeast Asia and India. Uh, the Middle East um, is, um, it has some bright spots, but we all know the challenges of the Middle East. And um, I, 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 I'm concerned about the, the, the conflict in the region and what that means for U.S. business interests in that region. Um, so we'll see how that plays out, but I think that's going to be a more of a geopolitical issue than, than an economic issue. Uh, Eastern Europe, is, is, uh, is, as Karun was just saying, is, uh, it's astounding what we're seeing in, in Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan. Uh, the, 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 the rapid development of these countries is really extraordinary just in the last 10 years. Uh, Europe, you know, putting aside the Greece issues, Europe is getting it right. Uh, we see a lot of opportunity for infrastructure development. But the big issue around our business in infrastructure is in the big urban markets of the major cities of the world. So take the top 30 cities in the world and you look at the expected growth of the urban population in, in the top 25 or 30 cities. That's where the, the, the big uh, projects are gonna happen. That's where the big need is gonna be. There's a, just this rapid urbanization that is, is a trend that is extraordinary, and it's a freight train coming at us with the need for infrastructure. So uh, where I see it is it's not sector specific, it's not transportation or water or, or energy, it's big urban markets um, and then uh, some, some key large macro geographies like Southeast Asia and India that, that caused me to be very bullish. Uh, and then you can't count out uh, Africa. Africa got incredible natural resources. Their agriculture uh, industry is, uh, is, is, is very untapped, and I think China sees that, which is why they're investing in that market. Okay. Thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, happy to hear you talking about the opportunities in Southeast Asia. I was in Singapore most recently, now back here in Washington. Um, one of the things we're hearing about, I'm working now on China, but one of the things we're hearing about from the Chinese is probably a recurring theme that maybe you've talked a little bit with Arun about, which is um, third country collaboration in other markets. So in this instance, uh, are you being approached at all by, say, the Chinese to do work together with them in Africa, in Central Asia, or in Southeast Asia? And I don't know if you can comment too publicly on that, but what do you think about those opportunities? Do you see it? Uh, logical collaborators or logical competitors? Your thoughts on that? Um, before I close, just also thank you because your team down in Singapore did some training for an entire group of our locally engaged staff. It was very helpful, so thanks again. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, the Chinese uh, are formidable competitors, but they're also uh, partners. And uh, so my recent trip to Beijing was to meet with the, with the two largest uh, contractors in China, and uh, they reached out to us. They asked me to come and visit with them to talk about a partnership. Um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, as any partnership, you got to be wary, uh, go into it with your eyes uh, wide open. But uh, uh, I, I think there's a, a great opportunity for us to partner with the Chinese in some of the big markets. Uh, they have been a big player in, uh, in Africa, but they're becoming a bigger player here in the U.S. Um, the, uh, the, the size and scale of the projects that they are taking on just in the past few years is, is significant and uh, they are interested in partnering with us on projects like the Panama Canal, uh, bridges in New, in, in New York City, uh, big uh, hotel projects in the Bahamas they're working on. Uh, so they're, they're, they're coming into the North American market, uh, but we are also partnered with them in, in Europe and Africa right now. So I see them as a, a good uh, uh, 
partner as we look at the top 10 contractors in the world we work with. Most of these big projects, whether it's partnering with Bechtel on the Riyadh metro system um, or partnering with the Chinese on the Panama Canal, uh, it's a global landscape now and uh, we'd prefer to partner with U.S. companies, but in some cases uh, it's uh, advantageous to partner with uh, Chinese and others. John? Yes, Jen, Jen, okay. Yeah, the mic's coming. You've talked, you've talked about XM and the, importance, the important role they play for U.S. firms uh, competing abroad in the financing realm. Interested to know how, how frequently AECOM works with U.S. government agencies, including Commerce and ITA, and in this changing global landscape where everyone's at the table, and with them comes various roles for their governments, how you are looking to work differently with the U.S. government or if your needs for um, services, export promotion services or other types of support from the U.S. government is changing in light of those new players. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely changing. Uh, uh, it's uh, our interest in increasing the involvement with the uh, U.S. government. And, you know, as I told Secretary Pritzker yesterday, uh, you know, 10 years ago when we were a $2 billion company, it was difficult to get a lot of attention uh, in, in, in Washington. Uh, now when you're a $20 billion company, you know, almost a Fortune 100 company, uh, it, it's a lot easier to get uh, access to all of the great resources of the U.S. government. So um, I have to say that uh, you know, it, we, we probably haven't uh, had as good of a relationship with all of the resources of the government that, w that, that we should, and, and I see that increasing now. And, Thanks to Arun for, for helping kickstart this. But we have done work with uh, you know, all of the embassies around the world and the commercial attaches for those embassies. Uh, we have local uh, affiliations like I hear in Singapore. Uh, I, when I travel around, I was just in the United Arab Emirates and met with uh, Ambassador Barbara Leaf uh, while I was there and her commercial attache. And so we do, we do have local contacts with the embassies and, and your, uh, many of, of your associates in all of those countries. Uh, XM Bank is something we've worked with uh, quite a bit over the years on, on special projects. Uh, we've used the, tr the uh, trade advocacy group of the, of the Commerce Department on only a couple instances, not enough, and we'd like to uh, increase that, and that was, again, a topic of our discussion. That's Jenna Pilot there. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, and, uh, and it's something we clearly can use, our, use your help, and one of the topics um, that was helpful uh, yesterday is I think a lot of people didn't realize how much work we do in the defense space. Uh, we have about five billion of our revenue annually comes from the U.S. federal government. Uh, most of it in defense and intelligence, and uh, the opportunity to do that type of work in foreign countries uh, is is quite extraordinary. And that's the type of, of help uh, that, that that we could use. So you'll be hearing a lot more uh, from us, both in, in in how we can help you and 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 educate your teams, and how you can help us. So uh, this is just the start of it. Great. I think we'll take one more question from the audience. Uh, is there a question there? Behind Jenna, no? Hi, I heard you mention earlier about the clean cleanliness of, of the air and everything, how you were saying about uh, making... Uh, hold the mic sorry, closer, I hear. couldn't hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I noted earlier uh, your comments about no one complaining about clean air and the health of the environment uh, after you've uh, done your projects at the infrastructure. Um, and I heard you speak a lot about making the infrastructure efficient and decreasing the friction, but could you speak a little bit more on your commitment to making the infrastructure sustainable and, um, for the environment? Great question. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear it, the question was, what, what, what's our commitment to making infrastructure more sustainable? And, and you know, sustainable means a lot of things to a, a lot of people, uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have designed more LEED certified buildings than anybody in the world, any other firm in the world. Uh, we're the largest architecture firm in the world, but more importantly, what we're proud of is we've, we've, we've designed more LEED certified buildings that are better 
for the environments in, in which they reside. So uh, that's one, but, but it, it, it's not just it's good for the, the environment in the abstract, uh, but most of these structures are, are built in a way that they can last a long time, so we don't have to rebuild it. It's not just about what is their impact on the, on the environment today, but how do we make them so they can last longer so we don't take more of the natural resources of the, of the environment to build them again. And so that is a fundamental design element of just about every single project that we're involved with today. We don't, we don't have a client that doesn't talk to us about sustainability, that talk to us about resiliency and how do they deal with resiliency from natural disasters or terrorist threats. Um, and so it, it has been, uh, it, it has increased, and in, in just in the past 10 years, um, it went from a buzzword uh, that people felt like you need to throw around to something that is embedded in everything we do. And so uh, you don't talk about <laughs> building a power plant uh, today without talking about exceeding the clean air requirements. Uh, you don't talk about a water treatment facility today where people aren't designing it to the standards that exceed the minimum, not just barely get there. Um, and so it, it really is embedded in the way we do business. It used to be a separate function. You know, go talk to the sustainability department. Our objective was to make that something that is embedded in everything we do. It's like breathing. It's just not, you don't think about it as an afterthought. But, uh, but that's a trend that has come in the U.S. We still have a lot of educating to do outside the U.S. You know, we know about the, the air quality issues that China has now, the, the rapid growth uh, that they've had in their industrial sector that uh, ha has not been kind to either their air quality or their water quality. So uh, we have a lot of educating to do uh, in some of these markets we operate. So Mike, the last question, I thought I'd just change the topic a little bit. So you lead an organization of over 100,000 people, multiple countries, multiple cultures. So clearly you would have thought about you know, the principles of management and leadership that you apply. Would you like to share those with us? You know, it, it's, uh, our business is a people business. And, uh, you know, w once you, people say, how do you keep track of? We have 30,000 projects going on at any given point in time, 24 hours a day. There's somebody operating in some part of the world in sometimes strange and dangerous places. How do you sleep? How do you keep control of it all? Well, I don't control it all. I do one thing. I hire great people. And you know, I'm proud that we have 100,000 of some of the brightest minds in the world working for this company uh, that are trying to do the right thing and, and they're driven by a mission of making the world a better place. They care about this stuff. And so you hire good people that care about the mission, uh, for one, and then my job is to hire great leaders. And I can't know what's going on in Afghanistan today, uh, but I know I have a guy that's in Afghanistan that, that, that is a person that I trust. Uh, that has great judgment. And so it's, it's like it's, it's, all the people here in this room, you've hired great people. Um, you inspire them with a vision and you encourage them along the way and give a little course correction at times. But uh, it's all about hiring the greatest people and, and trusting them to do the right thing. And uh, it's, uh, it, 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 I've long since uh, 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 lost uh, faith in trying to control everything. It's just not possible anymore. So it's hiring great people and, and hopefully uh, charting a, a path for them. Great. And as you said, we have great people. We have great yeah. people in over 80 countries in all the 50 states, yeah. very motivated, very innovative. And for me, I've been here 15 months and they're an inspiration in terms of the way they think, the way they execute, the way they push the country's agenda forward. Yeah. So great to have you as a partner with us in this. And Mike, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you.